What a glorious, glorious day that God has brought before us today so that we could come in here and praise and to worship God uh, and to be in the fellowship with one another. Uh, the, the scripture that God has put on my heart today is in Haggai, which was in your pamphlets. If, you're not, if you'd like to turn there and follow along. My wife, uh, she didn't know what I was teaching exactly until this morning, but she, but in her lesson, she touched on a lot of things that the scripture is going to touch on. And uh, something had kind of hung with me on something on one verse, and you'll understand as we get through the scriptures here. Uh, oh, there it is. She did uh, first, or Second Corinthians chapter nine. And uh, verse 7 kindly stuck out to me. Uh, and it says, Every man according as he purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Amen. And I come up here today with, with a really heavy heart. Um, there's been some things that's been, been kind of bothering me, and, and I feel like, you know, that I'm... I'm me and her both had a youth ministry in, in Clifton for 11 years. And it's a successful ministry. And Holly was a part of that, so she's over shaking her head yes. Uh, and it got where I got, I got where I was dreading coming to church. And it was because I was having to butt heads with different people in the church as to how we were operating and doing with our youth and stuff. And so when I told them we were stepping down, they said, well, you know, if we... You know, what if we change? What if we make a change and we do something, you know, do something about it? And the point about it is that I'm trying to make to you is I don't want, you know, I come to church to be filled just like everybody else. Amen. I come to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I come for the fellowship. I come for the love. And anybody that knows me knows that everything that I do for God is because I love God. Amen. And I don't want to be in that situation again where I'm coming and dreading coming to church because of, of something that's going on or not going on or whatever. And, uh, you know, this is the body of Christ. Yes. And we've all got to work together. Amen. And I was actually sitting in my hotel room as I went to a uh, class reunion last week and I texted my Uncle Bob and, I, and, I, and the Lord had put this on my heart and I, and I texted him. I said, man, do you remember where that scripture is? And he gave it to me. And I said, man, the Lord's put one hell of a sermon on my heart. Yes, I said hell. It's in the Bible. H E double -L. Hell's in the Bible. It's in my Bible. Thank you. Thank it's you. Um, I, might, I might use it a little bit more than I should. But Balaam's you know. ass is in there too. Balaam's ass is in there. <laughs> but anyway, so the Lord had had, uh, had, had put that on me. And I, I think I won't bother. thought I was going to be here last week because I told the Lord to put that on me. I said, well, it wasn't my time. You was here for a reason. It wasn't here me. It was here to here Brother Randall. It was good. Yeah. Um, so the scripture uh, that we're doing today, and I'm sure, I know i got a couple of people in here like to read ahead before I do a sermon, and some of it is, it is in the physical sense, you know, what's taking place in these scriptures we're fixing to do. But it's also in the spiritual sense. Um, so I will be teaching that on both levels. And uh, so Haggai means feast or festival. You know, feasting on truth and knowledge. And that's what we should be doing each and every day is feasting on the truth and the knowledge of God's holy word for our instructions in our life today. Alright, so Haggai was the first prophet that God spoke to after the 70 year captivity to the Babylonians. Alright? And it is about, it is time, it is a time of getting your house in order. Now when I say Getting your house in order. I'm not, I'm not talking about just your house at home. We're talking about this house right here. This is the house of God. God, this is God's ministry. I, you know, He's the one that, that is in control of it and its growth and the things that take place in it. We've got to keep this house in order. Right. But there's another house that we need to be trying to keep in order, and that is the body of Christ. Okay? So that's what I was saying. It's in several different tenses here, the physical and the spiritual. Ezra and Nehemiah were instructed to go back to Jerusalem to fix Jerusalem and repair the temple and the altar of God after that captivity. 
So they were sent back there to do that, but yet 15 years later, and they've not even started working on God's house. Mm. So God was not too happy. Alright? And that kind of thing also happens in our own lives sometimes. You know, we, we tend to fall away from the Lord and come back and fall away and come back. But we got to get our house in order, don't we? What is our inner house? It's our spiritual body. We've got to keep that house in order too, do we not? Can I get an amen? amen. amen. Alright? So, that makes this chapter very, very important that we understand what's being said and taking place here. Alright, so we're going to pick it up. Verse 1. Holy Spirit sees fit. We will do this entire chapter. Amen. And uh, did I realize when I started studying this again, I actually preached a sermon on this uh, in 2018. I'd love to go back and watch it and see my own personal growth how it come out today. Uh, so in the second year of Darius, the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel means born in Babylon. And he was born in confusion. But guess what? He came out of it. You think God's children need to come out of confusion today? Amen. I mean, with everything that's going on in the world today, don't you think we need to come out of confusion and see what's right before our faces and what's going on that's displeasing to God? All right, he was born in confusion, but God ended up using him in a mighty way. And you know what? I can relate that to my own story. The biggest sinner there ever was, if there's not much I've not tried or done. But guess what? God called me. Amen. A sinner like me to stand before you and bring forth the Word of God. Can I get another amen? Amen. amen. And the son of Shetiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Joseph, the high priest, saying, So the Lord's got a message here. And He wants Israel to hear this message. And He wants you to hear this message today. It's in the Word of God. We're supposed to hear that message, amen? Amen. Whether we like it sometimes or not, sometimes it's correction, sometimes it's blessings. But sometimes it's correction. Alright, verse 2. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying... It's God speaking here. Through the prophet. Okay? The people say the time has not come. They're saying, oh, it ain't time for us to go build. It's not time for us to go work on God's house. Okay? The time that the Lord's house should be built. God expects His house to be built first. God expects His house to be attended to first. Now is God not supposed to be the forefront of your life today? Amen. In everything that you do and every decision that you make? Amen. I can't help to brag on my guys that work with me. The Holy Spirit just kind of put that on me every morning. Uh, before we go to work. And if you won't see this much in the world today, a bunch of rugged construction men standing out in the parking lot in front of my garage and every day we pray to God before we go to work. Amen. Jesus Christ Amen. should be at the forefront of your life. And when Jesus Christ is in the forefront of your life, then guess what? You're going to obey His laws and His commandments. You're going to know what pleases and displeases Him. Don't you want to know what pleases God? Because I sure do. Amen. I want to know what displeases Him too, so maybe I won't do it again. Right. He expects His house to be attended to first. Without God, we are absolutely nothing. Amen. Amen. So here God, Jerusalem's in the shambles. The wall's been maybe patched up a little bit. But there the temple of God and the ark of the covenant is dwelling in a tent while they're out there building their fancy panel houses. And they're letting God's house dilapidate. That does not make God very happy. Verse 3. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai. The prophet saying, and I will say it again, God's word speaking through the prophet. Alright, verse 4. It is time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and the house, and this house lie waste. God is saying, you are not attending to my house. 
Now I told you this was in the spiritual sense and the physical sense. I ask you again, whose house are you sitting in today? We're sitting in God's house. What, hap what happens when you leave God out of the equation of your life? It's going to dilapidate. And you're going to fall away. Amen. There's a lot of work been done in this place. From the time we started coming up on a nine year anniversary. That bathroom, that kitchen back there has been totally remodeled. New cabinets, new floor, and the whole nine yards. We've got a fellowship hall over there that's been started under construction. We, we took away a bathroom to add a Sunday school room. And then we ended up putting the bathroom back. We got to have more bathrooms because we've got more people. Can I get a praise God? We are the many body member of Christ. Mike, I was kind of hoping Mike was going to be here today, but he can watch the, the taping as if, if he does. But, you know, he, he was standing outside, and, and I don't know who we were sitting out there talking to, or I was, I was sitting up there by the door. And whoever he was talking to, he said, he looked at me and he said, when are we going to do a work day? And I'm sure his eyes got really big because he seen a little bit of righteous indignation in my attitude towards him asking me the question about the work day. You see, we don't have to have a work day to do work on God's house. Amen. Now we do a work day twice a year, three times a year, four times a year, maybe. Right? right? But what about the work that's got to be done every day? See, when we walk outside that door, the work don't stop. Mm -hmm. We work every day for this house of God. Day in and day out, Sunday after Sunday, month after month, and year after year. There are a group or a small group of people that do the majority in this house. And make all this happen. God expects us to take care of His house. You don't have to have a planned work day. Me and her come up here one day last week because we always make an extra trip up here. Went to Fellowship Hall. Trash on the floor. Trash on the tables. I wiped off the tables. I swept the floor. We got it in order. Before the wedding for Safi, the Fellowship Hall, they mopped the floor and said, Jerry said, I don't think that floor's been mopped since the day we put it down. Now that is sad. Now, each and every time before we ever leave the church, we always would sweep it up and you know do any kind of mopping we need to do. That's not even being done anymore. So do you have to have a plan work? Do you know how to paint? Anybody know how to paint here? I ain't raising my hand. <laughs> Be a giver, brother. You got, a, you got a wheelchair ramp over there next door that needs to be painted. Do you know how to run a vacuum cleaner? Do you know how to use a mop? Do you have to have a special talent to do those things? All of the work cannot fall on a small group of people when the whole body of Christ is sitting in this house. Come on, man. We've all got to pitch in. We've all got to do our part. And I'm going to be honest with you, I'm tired. I am. I had my uncle pray over me today when he come up to the altar. I said, i got a heavy heart, man. I, I mean, I'm just... I'm just I'm just, I don't know, I'm exhausted. And I know my poor little wife is because she does the same thing. So, it is our duty to God to take care of His house. I've lost my place. No, you haven't. You, you Verse 5. <laughs> you dead on. Now, therefore... On verse 5, Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Five times that phrase is mentioned in this chapter. Do you think we ought to consider our ways to see if we're doing what we're supposed to be doing? You know what that phrase actually means in Hebrew? God's saying, think long and hard about the words that I'm speaking to you. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing the Holy Spirit today? Amen. Thank you. Got one. How, let's try that again. Amen. Do you hear what I'm saying? Amen. Amen. I hear it. I hear it. I hear it. Now let's look at the spiritual sense. When is the last time that you did some work 
for the body of Christ. You see, God's house is in shambles today. And I'm not talking about this house now. I'm talking about the many member body. What does the Scripture say in Luke 14, 23? The, serv the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. God's house is in shambles. And what do I mean by this? See, we talk about this teaching every week. It is our responsibility as Christians when you go outside those doors that everything that you do is to the glorification of God. Amen. Everything that comes out of your mouth and everything that you do, you can be that example to somebody that is out in the world today and they're lost. You don't think that God's house is not shambles when a church thinks it's okay to plant a pole in the front yard with the pride flag to, to represent the homosexuals in the world? You don't think God's house is in a shambles when they think it's okay to murder babies? You don't think that God's house is in shambles today when they say God made a mistake. Amen. Now what do I mean by that? I'm talking about transgenderism. Amen. Oh, you just don't understand, brother. I just know I'm supposed to be a girl. I'm like, I use this example as crude as it is. I don't care if the farmer picks up the puppy and looks up under the undercarriage and it's either a male or a female. You don't think that God's house is not in shambles when they're letting the borders of this great nation that He blessed us with open. Mm. Pedophilia. Sex trafficking. Oh, this is a really good one. When a parent can take a five-year-old child who's not old enough to make this decision themselves and change their sex. Come on. They're not doing that for the child. They're doing that for themselves. Yes. Amen. God's house is in shambles today. And we've got to do some cleaning. Can I get another amen? Amen. amen. Verse 6. Ye have so much, and ye bring in little. Ye eat, but you have not enough. You're never satisfied. God's saying you're never going to be satisfied. As, as long as you are neglecting my house. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put them into a bag with holes in it. Yep, now, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. I told my wife when I'm studying, you know, all the studies that I've ever done, and I come across some scripture that, I, that I've lived. I've done. It's happened to me. You know, and I remember a time where all we did was work, no different than we're doing today, I guess, but we were putting God forefront of our, our house this time. Come on now. But it's like we worked and we worked and we worked, and man, I get all excited, think I'm going to, I'm going to make some money at the end of a job or whatever. I forgot to pay a bill. Mm -hmm. So I didn't make anything. I actually went in the hole. I worked and I worked and I worked and I worked and I'm sitting there and it finally got to the point I told her, I said, my God, I'm tired of working. That's right. I'm saying, I'm not, we're not getting ahead. Do you know why? Because I was not putting God in the forefront of my house Come on now. and my business. So what's happening is those people that are neglecting God's house today, it's like you're going down this big long hill and you get yourself a bucket of water and you go back up the hill and you dig up dog tired when you get up there. You ain't got no water in your bucket. You know why? Because God will put holes in your butt. Mm. He says, you can work all you want to, you can sow all you want to, but it ain't going to amount to a hill of beans. Mm. And what God says He means, and I'm telling you right now, testifying mm. before you, I have lived that before. And I thank God today we're being blessed, our business is being blessed, it's working all the people that I go to church with that are my brothers to to support their families and I'm finally seeing it happen. Oh yeah, it waited until I was 58 years old to do so, but I finally got it through my thick head what God wanted me to know. Come on. I'm 62 and I just learned to play music a year and a half ago. Amen. And I'm pretty good at it. That's right. Awesome. So basically, you reap what you sow. 
Galatians 6 7, For whatsoever you sow, so shall you reap. If you are going to sow little, you're going to get little. If you're going to sow much, you know what the problem is today? The reason them holes and them buckets are being made? Because you are sowing to yourself instead of sowing to God. Now when you sow to God and you put Him at the forefront of your life, I promise you, you will reap the rewards. Amen. I'm here to testify about that too. The blessings are awesome. Amen. Yeah. You got your dad on, man. Thank you, sir. Dad on. Seems like you've been talking to God. <laughs> yeah. Every Seems chance I don't know. Every right? chance Seems I get, brother. Seems like you've been talking to God. If you try to do this life without God, you are going to fall flat Amen. on your Amen. face. I don't care who you are. I'm telling you right now. And we see people getting ahead out there that we know aren't very good people and we think they're not. You know, they beat their wives, kick their dogs, uh, do whatever. Don't worry. They're going to get what they're reaping or what they're sowing. But turn around. Put God at the forefront of your life. Amen. Verse 7, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. God wants you to think long and hard about what He is saying right now. He's putting the rubber where it meets the road. How are you doing today? You know, I did a, a, a strain of sermons on self-examination. That's one of the best tools that a Christian can use. It's for you to self-examine yourself to see what it is whether you're doing good for God or whether you're displeasing to God, if you're truly honest with yourself and you correct, let God rub those rough spots out of you, mm. son, you will be golden and whole at the end of it. <laughs> now, each and every one of us are on the potter's wheel. Right. We're going to make mistakes. There's going to be little divots in the side. There's going to be wrinkles and lines that are too wide. But stay on the potter's wheel and let God smooth out the rough edges for you today. Mm. And the best advice that I could give any Christian in the world today is first and foremost to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. And the second thing is to be in this Word. Come on now. The Word of God is your roadmap to navigate this life today successfully. There's not one thing that's not in this Bible how to raise your kids, how to have a successful marriage, how to have a successful business. I mean, it's all in here. All you have to do is take the time, pick it up and read it and study it. Man, what a difference in my life that that's made. Mm. Verse 8. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the house. I will take pleasure in it and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Now, if you read about old Solomon, I mean he built one expensive, fancy, fancy temple with marble floors. Here God's uh, Ark of the Covenant's resting in a tent. And God says, go up to the mountain and cut some wood for crying out loud and come back and frame me a house. And I'll be happy. See, because it's not the building that we need to worry about. It's the body of Christ that we've got to be worried about. You see, if we're reaching the body of Christ and we're convicting souls, the other's going to fall right into place. Can I get another amen? Amen. You know, Christ said that He would rebuild the temple in three days before His crucifixion. He is the temple. Amen. Yes. He died and He was in the tomb for three days and He rose again. Yes. Verse 9. Ye looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why? saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is in waste, and ye run every man unto his own house. Mm. What little you do gain, God's going to blow it up. He's going to, all he's got to do is blow on it, and it's gone. We do have a lot of people in this church that work tirelessly. Week in and week out. And I can say Doug and Becky because ain't nobody in this church can argue that. Nobody. They work tirelessly behind the scenes. But now, 
my wife pointed out this morning very surprisingly said this to me i was very very surprised it says you know we are two of not not the only two let me the uh, that are the oldest of the church the oldest ones in here we may not look at it but you know I we thought get, you, we I get, thought she's about forty. Thank you. I love you. Hey. Can I get a, Can I get hey, a, Don't give me up here dancing hey. now. Hey, I thought you about forty. <laughs> As the Bible says, we're getting a little long in the tooth. I mean, other people have to step up and do their part. Yeah, I couldn't believe she said that this morning. I was like, I can't believe you said that. <laughs> All right, verse 10. Therefore, the heaven over you is stayed with, from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. You're not going to have anything. If you don't have the water from heaven, how are you going to produce fruit? You can't grow crop, crops. You can't grow fruit. You can't do anything. So God is saying, if you continue down the path that you are doing, and you are not going to take care of my house, He's going to stay the dew from heaven. You know that beautiful dew when you get up in the morning and you look out and it's sparkling across the grass? He's saying, I'm going to take it away. You're not going to have it. Verse 11. And I called for a drought upon the land and upon the mountains and upon the corn and upon the new wine and upon the oil and up that which ground bringeth forth and upon the men, upon cattle and upon all the labor of thy hand. I couldn't help but think about this verse and we've used it several times over the years. 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and their land will be healed. Amen. Amen. We're in a drought today. Yes. Amos 8, 11. Behold, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine for bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of Amen. the Lord. Amen. That famine is upon us today. And that's why you see so many Christians turning their backs, yes, I said, turning their backs on God and His laws and commandments and bending to the will of Satan and this world. Verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shetel, and Joshua, the son of Jodak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people. Did you hear that? All the remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him and the people did fear for the Lord. They all obeyed him. Will you all obey him today? Every single one of them turned back. Verse 13. Then spake Haggai, the Lord's messenger, and the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. Amen. Folks, if the Lord is with you, who can be against you? Nobody. Absolutely nobody. Verse 14. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shetel, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, and the high priest, and the spirit of the remnant of his people. When we do the work, we keep God's house going, folks. The enemy's not going to stop us. As you know, my uncle goes to Walmart all the time. <laughs> they, they can't stop us. Because you can be standing in line at Walmart and be praying to God. Amen. Yeah, they will never stop us from praying and worshiping our God. <laughs> Verse 15 to wrap it up. In the four and the twentieth day of the sixth month in the second year of Darius the king. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. Everyone please bow your heads. <laughs>